Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Tabletop Toolbox. I'm Jeff, your host of this 11th episode of the weekly Ratchet. In this episode, I'm going to take us back through time. Here, see, on the weekly Ratchet. Hey there, everyone. Thank you for tuning in here to the Weekly Ratchet. Welcome back. I hope you've all had a fantastic past week of gaming and hopefully other great fantastic things. It's April 15th right now. That is tax day here in US. Yay, you know, the day that we're reminded of how much democracy costs, at least for now. Anyways, hey, uh, it's been a crazy week and weekend here in Ashland, Virginia. I am still trying to finish up this Voidfall review for the Dice Tower channel. I have put a ton of time in editing this thing. It has some of the most complex visual effects I have attempted in at least quite some time. So I have let them know that it should be ready by the end of this week. I've only got a couple little things to touch up and it'll be done and I hope that you enjoy it out on the channel. I've also worked on something over the weekend, Simulation Chris. If you're watching, I got something for you buddy. My daughter and I sat down right here at the table over the weekend and put together a little segment. I hope I will have it out by this weekend. We shall see. And then of course, I've got a Ratchet episode to get out here, hopefully before the night is over. So the only way I'm going to get make that happen is if I get to it. So let's check out some new games. Actually, just one new game this week, but I am really excited for this thing. Oh man. Heavy, heavy, heavy box. This is Starship Interstellar. It is, it is from Pendragon Studios, and the designers are... Uh, okay, let me, let me see if I can pull this off here. Andrea Crespi and David Calza, or Cal Calza. Uh, I believe it is an Italian publishing group. So this game is... is fairly old as far as you know the whole kickstarter thing goes this was a kickstarter game i backed this uh, i want to say sometime back in 21 or 22 it was actually supposed to deliver last year about uh, february of last year and it just came in which hey at least it made it so i'm not upset but I actually got to play this on Tabletop Simulator uh, back when it was still active on Kickstarter because, you know, knowing that it was kind of a small name publisher, I wanted to try and make sure that there was indeed a game here. And uh, I played this online with uh, my good friend Doug Hager, who commented here in one of the previous episodes, and another kind of random gentleman who uh, volunteered to play when I put a post out on social media. And this game was heavy. <laughs> Man, it's a really intricate theme. Uh, well, it's not an intricate theme. Quite frankly, it's very similar to the game of Evacuation in that mankind has realized once again that they're destroying the solar system. Now the Earth's not good enough. Now we're destroying the sun. And so we have to build this massive spaceship, the Starship Interstellar, and head out into the uh, Trappist system. I did not know there was a Trappist system. Maybe there isn't. I don't know. Uh, to find a new planet to go and live on. And it's a lot of resource management. There is actually a solar system in the game where the planets kind of spin around uh, you've got to you know put bases on those different planets here in the solar system the the eight planets of our uh, milky way and you've got to you know get resources and, and work on building the ship there's a lot of tracks lots of things to manage lots of resources there's a market uh you know that you it, it makes prices fluctuate and all that kind of good stuff Really, really heavy game. We didn't even get to finish it. We played it, I think, for three hours. Tabletop Simulator is a little slower of a platform to play on, and it took us, I think, an hour and a half just to teach. So anyways, really, really excited for this. It also came with a mess of expansions and some extra stuff. Let's see, we've got the uh, Antimatter expansion. We have the Danger from Kuiper. I thought it was kind of funny, another uh, Kuiper system related game, kind of like Hyperium. And then Haley's Comet. Uh, and there was also some upgraded planet pieces, some Kickstarter stuff, all kinds, all kinds of stuff came in this box. I don't know when I'm gonna get to play this. Uh, I'm sure within the next couple of weeks, my friend Daniel is excited to check this one out. A really neat game, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that it has retained all of its juicy, crunchy goodness. That is, that's it. That's all that actually came in this week. So let's jump on to question of the week. Mm -hmm. 
All right, question of the week. I got a lot of good comments from folks last week. They weren't all pertinent to the actual question of the week, which is fine. There's some really good discussion out there. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome and thank Joel Davis and Tim Kulinich, uh, the designers from the Unpub event that I mentioned last week, who jumped on the channel and uh, you know had some nice comments to share seeing their games on the channel last week. And of course, my invite is open to you gents and anyone else who want to come out and talk about their unpublished games here on the Weekly Ratchet. So thanks for stopping by. Also, Cartoonist mentioned that he is a hobby game designer. Said that he was working on something of a side-scrolling style board game. Makes me kind of think of Thunder Road Vendetta. I'm sure it'll be better. I'm sure it'll be better. <laughs> Rentless said that he too has started dabbling with board game design and mentioned a tile-laying Western-themed game where folks would take turns controlling a sheriff on his quest to take down bandits. That does sound pretty neat. It kind of reminds me of the Wild Tiled West, but what you're talking about sounds a bit more involved than I think that Polyomino game, and that's, that's not a bad thing at all. Kay said that she'd love a game that merged trick-taking with city building and some push your luck. Um, you, you enjoy yourself. <laughs> uh, two of those three are themes that I kind of tend to stay away from myself. I'm, I don't have anything against trick taking, but I'm just kind of done with it. You know, I played spades and hearts and all that kind of stuff all through high school. And I'm like, okay, that was then and now is now. But uh, I do love city building games or any kind of a building game, as I mentioned in the previous episodes. And uh, Kay did mention some other themes like building a dam or a giant bridge. And that, that does sound kind of neat. I love the idea of maybe adding some engineering elements where you're trying to build, uh, you know, something that could stand up to certain requirements. Of course, that was probably going to be a little more heavy than what you might be looking for, but it sounds kind of neat to me. Uh, Matt Ball said that he'd love something that would combine the pathing of Ryan Courtney's games, kind of like the Trailblazers I mentioned last week, with some of the combo systems used in Vital Lacerda games. I don't know, Matt, that's starting to sound like one of those hard-for-no-reason Fister games. Not sure on that one. Also, not sure if you're just trolling me on that one, but uh, that's okay. Uh, and like I said, a lot of other good comments from folks, just kind of general conversation. So I'll share my idea. I actually, I can't quite say that I put pen to paper on this, but I did start taking some notes as I had an idea of a game my wife and I like to watch a show on the History Channel called The Curse of Oak Island. And this is about a couple of, uh, a couple of very well-to-do gentlemen who are funding a rather large excavation project on Oak Island, which is off the coast of Nova Scotia up in Canada, as they're trying to find buried treasure that they think could be linked to the Freemasons and deposited somewhere back in the 16 or 1700s. So far, they find a bunch of trinkets, a bunch of junk, little stuff like that. They've also found some... Uh, Native American uh, you know, pottery and such, which actually shut them down for just a little while because conservation groups jumped in there to kind of protect all that stuff. We love the show because it's just a silly, ridiculous show. Everything that they, everything that they find, they link to this treasure, even though there's no actual link really evident. And they, they do very little to actually confirm any of their suspicions. Everything is just, well, it could be this. And then immediately that's what they roll with. Oh, this is obviously a Roman coin. Sure, yeah, that's what you said it could be. And so therefore that's what it is. What I thought about doing, what I find interesting with the concept of the show is that it's been going on for something like eight or nine seasons now, maybe even longer than that, I've lost track. Uh, we can't watch it anymore. We have to stream it, which we're always streaming a season behind. So we're way behind the current uh, you know, events of the show. But it just keeps going, right? They keep finding nothing. They keep poking holy, all these holes in the earth. They keep traveling to other countries to look at things that they say they can link to their excavation there on Oak Island, even though, again, nothing really seems to be all that similar. But what I find fascinating is the fact that these guys, some of these guys are millionaires, and they've obviously managed to keep this show running and keep this project going for several years despite finding anything of significant value. And that's what I wanted to make the game out of, was how could you find this stuff, research it in a way that you get kind of a bogus answer as to what it could be, 
And then you use that to either sell for quick profit to keep funding the excavation project, which is not what they're doing. Uh, or you then kind of use it as promotional material. So you're using it to, to sort of lure uh, investors into keeping your show going. And so at the end of the game, no one finds the treasure. There is no treasure to find in the game. That would be an expansion in case they ever actually find it in the show, but I'm not holding my breath. But anyways, uh, I think that'd be just a neat idea and I, I could see all kinds of neat little, you know, 3D plastic cranes and diggers and such and, and having a board in the shape of Oak Island and having this stuff out there and you're fighting to get permits, you're fighting to get access, you're fighting weather issues, you're fighting, uh, you know, conservationists and such who, you know, want to kind of shut down your operation. Just all that kind of stuff I think would be a really interesting game. Anyways, that's uh, that's that. Okay. Uh, also, I did get some great feedback on uh, just my casual suggestion of maybe doing some crowdfunding at some point down the line. Folks were pretty supportive of that, and I appreciate it. Again, nothing coming up soon. Nothing to get excited about right now. You don't have to start counting your pennies. Uh, that'll be some time off in the future. And I agree, I need more subscribers before that will happen. But again, thanks for the support. All right, for next week, real quick, not sure if there's gonna be an episode next week. I'm actually hoping to leave on some vacation this Friday, going out to our cabin out in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, if things work out, I'm gonna try and bring some gear with me. I just don't know how well I'm gonna be able to edit. Uh, as my, I, this is what I would have to bring, and this is not in, in any means an advanced video editing uh, piece of hardware. But we'll see. If I do manage to get an episode out next week, though, I want to ask you, how do you prefer to learn new board games? This is a really a hot topic. It's always something that folks talk about, whether they like, like to read a rule book or like uh, whether they like to watch videos, so on and so forth. Uh, I've certainly done a little bit of both, but especially as I've been getting some of these more obscure games, some of the stuff that either the Dice Tower has sent or some of these Kickstarter preview games that I've been getting, uh, you know, there's no material out there for a lot of these, so I've had to resort to the rule books, and some of them are barely even able to be called rule books, and so it's been very difficult to learn some games. And lately, I've really seemed to struggle with learning new games. I don't know what it is. I was trying to, I'm still trying to learn that Jung Nan game, uh, and I'm still trying to learn the Epox game that was sent in from Ice Makes. And I, I, I keep looking at the rulebook and just nothing is clicking for me. Uh, and I almost feel like I've kind of hit a wall. I mean, I, just, I have too many rule books up here. I don't know. But anyways, curious. How do you like to learn your games? That's the question for next week. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay, we're already cruising through the ratchet here. Let me get to some games I have played recently. The first one is one I've talked about a couple times. This is Drop Drive. Uh, played this uh, late last week with my wife. Got some of the new expansion content. I was talking about it last week. And in fact, I'm gonna take a quick moment to give a shout out to Phase Shift Games. I made a comment last week about getting this expansion box with, oh, hang on, I dropped it, this giant block of foam in it, and I was a little perturbed. Uh, they asked for a review through a kind of an automated email from their website, and so I left one, and I gotta hand it to them. They found my channel, and they came out uh, on last week's episode and made a very positive, a very friendly comment last week about how they designed this to hold all the original anomaly content that came in this box, which kind of makes sense because I can barely get everything into this box. This thing is kind of stuffed. The problem was they mentioned that they use these Mylar bags. I have one, right? Oh, here it is. Uh, so I put one of the anomalies into this bag. You can kind of see that it, it doesn't really close up correctly. I can't, I can't get this thing to seal. There's both cards and some uh, little plastic gems that are in here to represent a resource. And so it doesn't really close up very well. Now I had thought about doing just that. I thought about getting plastic bags to store the stuff in, kind of keeping each anomaly in its own, you know, sort of individually wrapped, if you will. But I still don't agree that this box was worth $35. And I have the invoice sitting right over there. Uh, you know, there was maybe five bucks worth of stuff in this box and I'm, I'm, I'm still a little perturbed at the price. Uh, so anyways, I will still say kudos to you guys for coming out and commenting. Appreciate the, uh, the uh, taking the high road and all that kind of good stuff. So cheers to you guys. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, oh, and my wife kicked my butt in that game again. I've got to figure out what I'm doing wrong in Drop, drop Drive. Anyways, 
Up next, I will mention another quick game of Voidfall. I played Voidfall late last week with my, with my friend Daniel, who did enjoy seeing himself on the show last week. Had a good chuckle out of that one. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm finishing up my review for Voidfall, and I've been putting a ton of time into it, and it's interesting because we played it again last week because I had actually lost a piece of footage of Daniel and I playing, which I referenced in the script, so I had to re-record that segment. We decided to go ahead and play the game again. Now, I had a phenomenal game of Voidfall last week, the, the best game of it that I've ever had. Unbelievable score, got some things that really just jived right off the get-go and had a great game of it, and I don't really remember how? I don't remember how was I able to attack on that first round. Uh, how did all the other combat go? Like I don't remember so much of the game because so much of the game is just trying to find points. All you're doing in Voidfall is just trying to get points as much as you can. There's no story. There's no adventure. There's no real excitement in the game. I was so excited about beating my previous high score by 96 points, by the way. Uh, but that was it. That was the only part of the game that I really got excited about. And looking back at it later, I couldn't even remember a lot of key sort of steps or things that happened in the game, even just sort of the general maintenance of the game. I couldn't remember how those things played out. I did go back and watch some of the footage so I could put it in the video and it was kind of funny going, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's how that happened. So I don't know. I, I thought about adding some more commentary to the review. Like I said, it's already over 20 minutes. I think I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I, I still like the game. It's a great puzzle, but it is not an epic game. It's a hard game. It has a ton of pieces into it. It's a challenge. And that's about it. Voidfall by Nigel Buckle and David Turtsey. Okay, next game I played uh, into the weekend, and this was a fun story. Let me pull, pull this box up here. This is called Prehistory. It is by A Games, and I'm just gonna maybe zoom in on the designer name because those are characters of a language that I just don't even know how to pronounce, and I don't want to butcher the gentleman's name. Uh, I've had this game for a long time. This was a Kickstarter project, I want to say back in 2018 or early 2019, and I was backing it because it looks pretty cool. But then I found out I was losing my job, and so I had to pull my pledge, got a new job. By the time I got situated, the game, you know, the Kickstarter had ended. They were going to add me to their list, and then I just never heard from them again. So I got this off of the Game Steward, and I played it once, a long time ago, and I couldn't really remember much of it, and I really wanted to try it again. You know, I believe that gaming is a skill, and I believe that as you play and you play and you play, for especially for as much as, as I do, and I'm sure a lot of us do, you just get to understand games in a better way with every game that you play. And so I've really enjoyed coming back some of these old titles, like I mentioned Alchemist last week, Prehistory this week, uh, and I got to play this again with my wife, and it was a really interesting experience. So what I've decided to do is I'm gonna make this my featured game for the week. This is something I wanna try this week. I'm not saying I'm gonna do this every week, but I'm actually gonna show you a little bit more about this game, give you some close up of the components, talk a little bit about the rules, and I'm gonna start that right now. Okay, what you're seeing here is basically the end of a two-player setup of a game of Prehistory. Prehistory plays with sort of two major play areas in front of you. You've got this board here, sort of the main action board. This is tracking players' points, and it also tracks the different actions, approximately six, that players will be able to take through the game. And I'll cover those in just a moment. Over here in the left side is what you can kind of consider a landscape of area around this board. So if you actually look Look right here, there is a small tile that represents this entire board. So you'll eventually be exploring out of this area into the surrounding lands around your central village. Okay, here we have an up-close view of the starting game board. There's no actual name to this. I'm going to call it the village board because it's kind of the starting village for all the players. You're going to notice a number of these pricing wheels around the board here. At each of these six actions, this is actually two actions into one space, and there's also the central pricing wheel. Now, you're playing these out. You're setting these up to the being in the game, and each wheel stays static except for this one uh, unless players actually pay to change these, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Now, 
your original wheel, and I've actually kind of set this board back up a little bit closer to starting game. A few things are still kind of, uh, you know, mid play, or if you will, but for the most part, I've returned it back to its starting positioning for all the, the materials. So uh, I would set this wheel down, and then you're going to place a cube on this stone hinge display at the top pedestal of, or the top, uh, the top piece of all of these stone setups corresponding to the color around this wheel. Then players are going to get a number of these colored cubes based on their player board, which I'm going to show here in a moment. But what they would do is if they want to trigger one of these actions around the board, say the uh, stone painting up here or gathering goods here, this is a ceremonial dance uh, that you can do to collect these cards, which would score at endgame. You can go fishing using the bottom half of this wheel. You can go hunting using the top half of this wheel. This is how you're going to get other uh, village people out into the exploration board, which I'll show in a moment. And then as I mentioned, this is how you're painting stones or, or doing paintings on a stone wall on your player board, which again, I'll show in a moment. So if I wanted to come over here and gather one of these goods, that is this red apple action, which means I have to sort of donate goods to this red apple space on the board. And to do that, I would take any one of my cubes. It doesn't matter the color. I would put it onto one of the two pedestals of that action. Then I would pay based on which of these six tokens I want. So if I want this uh, brown token, say here, or the, the token at this brown location, I would then pay a brown resource to take this and place it on my player board. If I wanted to fish, I would have to spend a number of resources on the bottom half of this wheel to take any of these fish. You notice this one's a one, this one's a two, which means I have to spend one or two resources shown on the bottom of this wheel, which of course there's a maximum that you could spend of three for any three point value fish like this one. So I'd have to pay a blue, a gray, and a white uh, if I wanted to take a three token, but if I wanted just this two one, I could spend just two of those resources. And the same goes for hunting. I'm gonna be paying a number of cubes shown on the numbers on these cards. So if I wanted this three point card here, it's a footprint card, then I would have to pay each of the three resources on the top half of this wheel. Now, if a player can't or doesn't have the right resources, to, you know, to buy these. Like, let's say I had a red and a blue, but I didn't have a gray or a white. Well, then I could spend what's called a development, and that's this kind of, uh, this uh, horn type setup, or this uh, tusk, sorry, this tusk tracker here. I could spend one of my development to rotate any wheel on the board, except for this one, one space clockwise or counterclockwise. So you see I've shifted this now, so the red and blue is shown, and I can then spend a red and blue resource to take a a two value fish, adding it to my supply. That's kind of generally how this board plays out. Let me jump over to the exploration board. Okay, so here's the exploration board. And again, you're seeing this now at a little bit late in the game, actually at the end of a game between my wife and I. We all started with uh, a couple explorers here on this central space, and then throughout the game, we're moving to get around this board. Now, if you had noticed around the central pricing wheel, there's a bunch of numbers around each of the resource, and when you go into the autumn phase of the game, you could spend resources to move. So, for example, looking here at the pricing wheel, you'll see there's a three above that red space, which means I can pay a red cube to move any one of my workers up to three spaces, and I can split that movement around. So if all these guys were here, here and I spent that red, I could move one, two, and three, then those workers would, or those explorers would lay down. They'd no longer move during that round. You can also spend more of those development points, those tusk uh, symbols that I showed to add additional movement to your guys. And what you're doing is trying to get around to these various camp locations. You'll see one located right here that's a camping spot. And when, a, uh, when you get to that location, you can basically use your people to build a camp. So if you look at the back of one of these tiles, try and get this into frame here, you'll see that there is two grays and one black figure on this tile. What that means is that you have to have three people on or around that space. You can never have two explorers in the same space. So to build that camp, I'd have to have a setup maybe like this one for the blue player. They've got three workers on, or sorry, I keep saying workers, three explorers on or around that space, which means I could then build this camp, but the black symbol means that one of them has to come back to my board because he's basically settling into that village. So this guy would kind of get spent to go into this camp. These two would stay 
stay on the board and I would get three victory points and two more of that development symbol on the development track. There's a bunch of other stuff going on out here. You can collect resources, you can get other action cubes, uh, and some of these, these are called monoliths at the end of the game, will score end game points. So for example, for every explorer that any player has on or around this space at the end of the game, we'll give them one victory point. And that's more or less how this works. Let's jump down to the player board. And here is a player board. This was my player board in the game. Again, this one is set up uh, basically at the end of the game. And you see a couple different things here. This is your weather wheel. This thing spins at the beginning of each of the five rounds of the game and will generate for you the resources shown around that wheel for the number of values that are shown. And again, you can spend a development point to move this wheel one direction clockwise or counterclockwise before each one of those seasons starts so that you can kind of adjust what resources you're getting, but you never get more than seven resources at the start of each round. Here are baskets where I have placed some of these gathering tokens that you saw up above on the main board. And there's a kind of interesting setup here that when you place a pair, basically one token on each basket, you'll generate these two action cubes, not resources. I'll get to that in just a moment. And they would go down here on the bottom of your player board. For each pair of tokens that you place on each corresponding vertical stack of baskets, you you will trigger that bonus again, getting yourself one of each of those two cubes. Now you'll see here, I've got a couple explorers ready to go. They're at my camp, ready to be deployed over to the exploration board. And again, if I build a camp that shows one of the black exploring tokens or symbols on it, then that person would come back here. So this kind of represents all of the camps that I have uh, and all the different explorers that I could deploy to those camps. Lastly, over here is my cave painting wall. You can see that I've collected a couple of these cave paintings, whenever you match uh, a side-by-side -side token on either a row or a column, you'll get the bonus shown around the perimeter. So for example, uh, this was one of the later tokens that I played, and when I played him out there, I triggered this adjacency, which gave me one of these mammoth action tokens. I also completed this adjacency to give me another one, and then I completed this adjacency, which gave me two more development points. Uh, and that's basically all you have just off frame here. I have a couple of the these ceremony cards that I had collected throughout the game. These are, uh, gave me quite a number actually of end game scoring. And then there is spot above the board where you place your resources, which are the same cubes. So let me try and cover that just real quick. Okay, back here at the main village board, I talked about how you can spend resources of any color and then spend another resource of any color to take things from these wheels. But that only applies in the spring phase. In the summer phase, you'll take the same actions, but first, any of cubes that were placed on these pedestals get slid up to the top. So let's say that these two had been placed down here, and they would slide up to this top stone before the summer phase. Then in reverse turn order, which is tracked down here, players will go around and select one of these stone displays to take all of the cubes from the top. These would go onto the bottom of their player board and they become action cubes. Then what you would do in the summer is you go clockwise around the board, starting with the top uh, stone painting display, and players will take that action as many times as they can or want, but all they spend are cubes corresponding to the color of the action. So if I wanted to do stone painting, and let's say I wanted to build this tile onto my, uh, you know, I wanted to paint this onto my board, or onto my stone display, I would have to spend a gray cube for each of the three symbols here, the red hand, the black hand, and the mountains, aka the bacon. So I would have to spend three gray cubes to paint this onto my main board, or my player board. If I wanted to get one of these cards, again, instead of having to pay the resources shown on the wheel, I simply have to pay the number of yellow cubes corresponding to the number on the top left of the card that I want to take. So just one yellow cube would give me this, two yellow cubes would give me this one, and you can only do the action once. And that's so on and so forth. So 
again, it's it's a very unusual game in that you're paying the resources in the spring specific to these wheels, but then in the summer, you're still taking the same actions, but the resources on the wheels themselves no longer matter. You're just paying the resources shown here. So for example, if I wanted the two value fish, I would simply pay two blue cubes, where I mentioned earlier the red and the blue costs, that no longer applies in the summer. And so you jump back and forth throughout the game, triggering the same actions, but with different types of resources. It's very unusual. So that was prehistory. I'm really glad I got this off the shelf and got to play through one of my older games. This is definitely a very unpredictable game. You, you know what resources you're going to get at the beginning of each year, but you don't know what action cubes you're going to get in the middle of the year to kind of continue through. And so you've got to, uh, you know, how do they say, make hay when the sun shines. And then on other times, you just got to kind of wing it. You got to do what you can do. And I was trying in those early years of the game, you know, early rounds, the first two years, I think, of the game to sort of plan ahead. Okay, I need to do this, I need to do that. My wife was zipping all around that explorer uh, board, the exploration board, and I just wasn't able to do it. And I felt like, okay, I need to get over there, I need to start working. And then I, I finally started to kind of click with it in the third year or so and realize, hey, look, she's getting points there. I've got points here and here. Let me keep building on that. And I started to really focus on my end game, and obviously it came through. I ended up with about a, um, a 10 point or so lead at the end. Definitely not something I think I'm gonna get played again anytime soon, maybe another four or five years, who knows? Uh, and I don't know, of course, if that means it's worth holding on to. But, you know, again, it was really neat to dig out something old and check it out and you know, get to see it in a new light. This was Prehistory by A Games. The last game I played, and the last one to talk about here this week, is Flamecraft. This is by Lucky Duck and Cardboard Alchemy. I can never remember the designer's name on this. Let's find out here real quick. Uh, Manny Vega and uh, Sandra Tang, or Sandera, Sandera, I'm sorry, I don't know, <laughs> uh, is the artist. And the, the story behind Flamecraft was that the artist does all these beautiful dragon prints and uh, either the designer or the publisher sort of linked up with her and said, look, we want to make a game out of your art. And they came up with Flamecraft. There's another one coming out here somewhat soon. Uh, it's about, I think, Critter Kitchen or something like that. It looks equally adorable. This is a game that looks very light, right? It just, it looks very cute. It looks almost sort of cartoonish. Uh, and, and it feels that way until you really start to play it and you really start to look at, you know, the way things kind of progress throughout this game. It is another game that I think you can have a strategy, but you have to be able to stop and identify when new scoring opportunities have, have presented themselves. And you've got to be able to allow yourself to be a little dynamic and sort of jump for some of those better opportunities when they reveal themselves instead of just staying stuck in a rut on whatever it is that you're trying to do. And this was another game where I was uh, trailing my wife and daughter through almost the entire game and then put up just a massive amount of end game points that I've been kind of working towards throughout the entire game. And uh, I think I had a 20 point lead at the end of this one. But I, I really like this. It's a great game for my daughter to play because same thing, it really forces her to be creative, to sort of think outside of, what am I gonna do this turn? What am I gonna do next turn? She's gotta be a little more dynamic. And uh, she did real well with this. She came in last place, but I think she was only two points behind her mother. And so I was really proud of her for that one. Flamecraft, a fantastic, beautiful, and deeper than you might think game. Hey, that is it for the Weekly Ratchet. Like I said, there may not be an episode next week. Cross your fingers, I'll see what I can do. If this thing doesn't catch on fire for me, I'll try and get something published for you folks next week. And after that, things are gonna get really interesting. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for tuning in, folks, and I will see you again soon. Take care, cheers.